Why, after all, did we choose the Nevada desert for our testing and dumping ground? Because it's the desert. There are hardly any people there, and even fewer white people. There's no capitalist infrastructure to be harmed. There are no corporate headquarters or corporations looking to develop that land. Not a single Amazon locker pickup point. Nothing of import. It's just a desert. As just a desert, it doesn't appear as ethically significant. After all, if some cacti, snakes, deer, and Indians get nuked a bit, so goes the thinking, that makes a lot more sense than doing the tests in downtown Las Vegas, right? That's just pure common sense, which is a code word for utilitarianism, the greater good for the greater number of people. And in the spirit of dumping our worst garbage underground, let me make it clear that I have come to bury utilitarianism, not to praise it. For the bloody math of the utilitarian calculus always and inevitably works out this way. Another publicized case was that of the Hiroshima maidens. 25 scarred women from Hiroshima were invited to the U.S. in 1955 to receive reconstructive surgery free of charge thanks to many good-willed people who donated their time and skills. While some historians saw American benevolence in hosting those women, other scholars have pointed out that the message the media dis disseminated was not about the plight of the women or the horror of nuclear weapons. The case was viewed as an opportunity to promulgate a new identity for post-war US citizens, that of white, middle-class, Christian, generous, suburban, heterosexual, nuclear families. Five months later, I'm sitting with Jimi Hendrix, who's showing me how to drink uh, um, tequila with the salt and the lime, uh, in the most insider nightclub in New York City, Steve Paul's The Scene. It was so insider that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page to this day. It was half owned by Andy Warhol, who really appreciated how avant-garde we were. As a matter of fact, one of the things I'm most proud about is um, Frank Zappa called us the freakiest group he'd ever seen. Sweet Sir Galahad went down with his gay bride of flowers and the prince of the hours of their lifetime. The brown lollipops that were circulated at the front desk are not specifically too good it suggested you stay away from them. Of course, it's your diabetes trip, but please be advised there's a warning on that one, okay? Stay away from the brown lollipops. And then Jimmy played 
and Gerardo drummed, and he drummed his conga and his corazón, and the day opened and we all went home with a heart full of amazement and love, not to mention pride. I was 25, now I'm 75. I'm still alive and still amazed and still a part of the Woodstock nation and unique combination of memory and awakening as the ground was shaking. The point I'm making is that the almost half a million of the Woodstock nation are fathers and mothers and grandmothers and grandfathers and sisters and brothers and there's no taking that back and that's a fact. I am yours. You are mine, you are what you are, and make it hard, hard, hard. You know you make it hard, hard. You know you make it hard. Work me I was also in the Young Lords, and we were fighting for the rights. We were fighting for women's rights. We were fighting for the ERA. We were fighting for women to control their own bodies. We were fighting for religious freedom, ethnic freedom. We were fighting for civil rights. Okay. Why is it so important that we say Neil and Buzz and a handful of other Apollo astronauts walked on the moon? Why is that first step of Neil so important, the image of Buzz's boot print in the lunar soil so iconic? Perhaps there's nothing we prize more as humans than our upright posture, but I believe it's more than this. 
After all of the technology, after the Saturn V devoured more than 40,000 pounds of fuel per second at ignition, after the onboard AGC and Disky jumped us ahead into the computer age, after the countless inventions and countless solutions to countless technical problems, the ultimate goal of Apollo was to go somewhere and take a walk, to stretch our legs, amble about a bit through the chalky powder of it all. Throughout the history of Western thought, from Socrates to Nietzsche, there have been those who have written about their love for and championing the simple pleasure of walking without trying to get someplace, the idea of taking a walk. There's something so quaint and old-fashioned, something utterly peaceful and relatable about celebrating an astronaut simply walking around someplace other than Earth, about the idea that together we accomplish this amazing feat of the sciences and the arts and the humanities, an accomplishment that ended by taking a walk. And now, in the tradition of ground control then, before we proceed, the flight director needs to initiate a launch status check. So I'm going to need a go, no go for launch around the horn from all our flight controllers. Associate Director Anna, are we go or no go for launch? Go! Front reception desk. Go! Graduate research assistants. Go! Major Tom. Go! Our guest lecturers. Go! Audience. Go! Yes, we are go for launch in the celebration of the 50th anniversary of Apollo 11. Thank you. I did work before for the Jet Propulsion Laboratory to find out what the moon was like to land on, to find out where they should land. Um, so I do have something to do with it. And I went to college at a school that required three years of humanities. So I am able to be here in that capacity too. Um, Humanities teaches you connections, um, how everything fits together and how broad everything is and how much there is. And that's what you need to know for system engineering. You know how, need to know what's going on and how to keep it going on together. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, and thank you all for uh, coming out tonight. Yes. Um, um, one of the most famous uh, images from the Lunar, or lunar Orbiter program um, is this one uh, on the right. It's a view inside the Copernicus crater uh, that uh, was billed by NASA as the picture of the century. Um, they, they released it, you know, t as to promote uh, the program. Um, and it, it, what you see is a barren, mountainous landscape, um, but what was interesting about it was that it's the, from the point of view of someone standing on the lunar surface. So it really gives you this sense of uh, the, the geography of the moon, the idea that someday, soon, someone, a human being, will actually be standing there and looking at it as we would look at a landscape.
and we use a plastic beach ball. <laughs> Did you feel anything? Yeah. What did you feel? Like a tap. A tap? Where? Here. Oh. <laughs> On my left shoulder. And you, could you remind me of your name again? Estre. Estre. It's a beautiful name. What's in the name, by the way? <laughs> an S and a J. It's beautiful. What is in the name? A rose by any other name would smell. Ah. Okay, okay. We can, yes, we can make this happen. A dead DePaul plant. <laughs> Shakespeare has been among the dead for centuries. And now, from death, life. Hum, everyone hum with me. For them is you know uh, a, a, a total catastrophe um, is sort of it, it's a success story for somebody else right and so to end on the note of this success the success yeah like all of this destruction has resulted in like some sort of birth right Pyman's um, here chocolate for everybody exactly yeah. and so um, so the ending was always supposed to be exultant. Um, and so was Midsummer, but in a different way. Um, ultimately, it felt like the only ending that could really exist for this film. Hmm. Um, and, uh, and what was important to me was that you know, everything be, in a sense, literal. Like th This was all happening. It's not a dream. Right. Um, <clears throat> and this has all happened. And you know, the film adopts this nightmare logic that kind of takes over. Yeah. And so you know, the family is losing their minds. The film itself is sort of losing its mind and tearing at the scene. Mm -hmm.